Hi everyone and thanks for joining. Why do we need salvation? Why is every human being, regardless of who they are or what they've done, in desperate need of Christ? Today we're going to go through Romans chapter 1, where Paul doesn't just introduce the gospel, he explains why none of us can escape the truth that we are all guilty and in need of a saviour. Now this message is for everyone, whether you're religious or not, because the consequences are eternal. So stick with me as we dive into Romans 1 and uncover the foundation of why the gospel is the only answer. And please watch to the end before adding comments as it's important we analyse the full chapter first. If you've watched the video till the end, by all means I'd love it if you'd throw a comment in there and give me your thoughts if you think I've missed something or uh, maybe if you think something isn't correct, feel free to throw it in the comments, but I would really appreciate if you watched all the way through first. We'll start with Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So right from the opening verse, Paul establishes his unique apostleship and the fact that he has been separated specifically for the gospel of God. His ministry differs from the other apostles in focus and timing, being particularly focused on the gospel of grace, which we will see as we move through Romans. While the gospel of grace was revealed through Paul, it was not entirely separate from God's promises in the Old Testament. The coming of Jesus and the work of salvation were always part of God's plan, and the prophets foretold this. However, the full revelation of grace, especially to the Gentiles or to those people who were not Jews, was a mystery that wasn't fully understood until Paul's calling. Now these opening verses lay the foundation for Paul's argument that salvation by grace through faith is the fulfillment of God's promises and it sets the stage for what he will explain in detail in the rest of Romans. If we move to verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So here Paul's making it clear that the gospel of God, which is the good news, gospel means good news. This is the gospel of God is centered entirely on Jesus Christ. Jesus is the focal point of both the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus preached during his earthly ministry, and of course on the gospel of grace, which Paul preached, although the messages between the kingdom the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God are distinct. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This emphasizes Jesus' human lineage, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah, or the Saviour, would come from the line of David. This is spoken about in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verses 12 to 16. According to Christ's human nature, Jesus was born into the royal family of David, which affirms his right to the throne of Israel in the promised coming kingdom, which was promised to Israel in the Old Testament as a covenant, an everlasting covenant. This reference to David connects Jesus to the promises made to Israel, showing that he is the rightful king. However, this is only one aspect of who Jesus is, as Paul will show in the very next verse. We'll look at verse 4. And, declare, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So this verse here shifts from Jesus' human nature to his divine or his godly nature. And declared to be the Son of God with power. Though Jesus is the seed of David according to the flesh, according to his body, he is also the Son of God, which was demonstrated with power through his resurrection when he was risen from the dead. The resurrection is the key event that validates his divine authority and power. According to the spirit of holiness. Now this phrase here highlights Jesus' perfect, sinless life and the fact that his ministry was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So while Jesus is fully human, he's also holy, set apart from sin, filled with the power of God. This contrasts with his human lineage and shows that Jesus is not just the son of David, but also the son of God. The next phrase is by the resurrection from the dead. 
the resurrection is the ultimate proof of Jesus divinity while Jesus was always the son of God the resurrection is what publicly demonstrated his power and divine nature so that we could all see it is the event that declares Jesus as Lord and Savior establishing the basis for the gospel of grace that Paul is about to preach and that Paul preached Jesus victory over death is the cornerstone of salvation by grace Let's have a look at Romans 1 verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So by whom we have received grace and apostleship. By whom, well that obviously refers to Jesus. Yeah? It's by Jesus Christ, through Jesus that Paul and others receive both grace and their apostolic calling. Now, the word grace refers to the undeserved, unmerited favor of God that Paul received. We know now that has been offered to us. It's a reminder that everything, including his calling and his salvation, comes from God's grace. If you know anything about Paul, his name was originally Saul. He was a Pharisaic Jew. He was killing Christians, persecuting the, the early church, and he was radically transformed. God, Jesus showed himself to Saul on the road to Damascus and converted him. Apostleship. Paul was specifically called to be an apostle by Christ. Okay? It was Jesus Christ that revealed himself to Paul. His apostleship was unique in that it was not part of the original 12, but was directly revealed by the risen Christ. This calling was distinct to spread the message of grace and bring the gospel to the Gentiles for obedience to the faith. What does this mean? Well, the purpose of this grace and apostleship is to bring people to obedience to the faith. This phrase means obedient belief or faithfulness to the gospel. Now, this gospel isn't just intellectual belief, which could be, you know, yes, I believe in Jesus, I believe he existed, or yeah, I know that he died on the cross and he rose again and all that sort of stuff but look the devil believes that everyone saw that that happened but it involves in obedience responding in faith to the message of jesus christ why did he die on the cross was it an accident or was it very deliberate it was very deliberate it was it was done so that he could pay for sin all right which we'll see throughout paul's letters trusting christ not trusting yourself and your good works all right that's what, that's what the obedience to the faith is. It's trusting Christ, not trusting yourself and your own good behavior or your own good works or your own merit. Paul's goal is to lead people to believe and obey the gospel of grace, which doesn't require works of the law, but involves a wholehearted response to the finished work of Christ. Among all nations. Well, this is a key phrase that reflects Paul's unique mission. His apostleship was limited to Israel, his, his, his apostleship wasn't limited to Israel, but was intended to reach all nations, both Jew and Gentile. This universal scope of Paul's message is part of what sets it apart from the gospel of the kingdom, which was primarily focused on Israel. And we know that Jesus' last, or some of Jesus' last words while on earth was to tell his disciples to go and preach this gospel of the kingdom but that was prior to the revelation being given to Paul. So once Paul got given this gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, he then went and explained this to all of the rest of the disciples and they were to then preach the same gospel as what Paul was preaching rather than the gospel of the kingdom. We'll see that again later. Paul's mission to the Gentiles, right, which is all of the other nations, was a new revelation that came through his ministry and reflected the inclusion of non-Jews in God's plan of salvation under the gospel of grace. Jesus said throughout his ministry, go not into the way of the Gentiles. I'm come but to the lost, of the sh lost sheep of the house of Israel. For his name, everything Paul does, his apostleship, preaching the gospel and calling people to faith is ultimately for the glory of Christ. Paul is preaching for the sake of Jesus' name to spread his fame and honor, not for his own gain. If we look at verse 6, among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ? Among whom? Paul has just spoken about his mission to bring obedience to the faith among all nations in verse 5. The phrase among whom 
refers to the nations as well as Jews who have come to faith. Are you also the called of Jesus Christ? Paul is specifically addressing the believers in Rome who are part of the called, those who have responded to the gospel message. This shows that the people he is writing to, which is in this case mostly Gentiles, are included in God's plan of salvation. They are now part of this new work that Christ is doing under the gospel of grace. The term called refers to those who have been chosen by God and have responded to the message of salvation by faith. Salvation by grace through faith. This includes everyone who believes in Christ, regardless of their background. Jew, Gentile, no difference. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now this shows us here that God's offer of salvation is definitely universal. It's open to everyone. Not everyone's going to accept it. Some people will, some people, will, some people won't. It's up to individuals to respond to his call by faith. There's no limitation placed on who can or who can't be saved. There is a heresy going around. It's been around for a long time. It's called Calvinism. It was created by a guy called John Calvin. It's obviously why it's called Calvinism, which in, and that teaches that God has predestined. You know, he's already determined where certain individuals are going, whether they're going to be saved or not. There's nothing you can really do about it. You know, God just specifically chooses these people out and, you know, that's just the way it is. And they chose me to salvation, but they chose you to death and damnation. Um, and they call this doctrine unconditional election. They, it's a false teaching. It's a lie. Um, and what these teachers do, or what John Calvin did, is just base their understanding on a small handful of uh, erroneous interpretations of Scripture. But in any case... Salvation is available to everyone. That's the bottom line. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, to all that be in Rome, Paul's addressing this letter to the believers in Rome, which would have included both Jews and Gentiles. This shows that the gospel he is preaching is for all who have come to faith regardless of their background. Beloved of God, Paul reminds the Roman believers that they are loved by God. This phrase emphasizes the deep personal relationship that God has with all who put their trust in him. It is a reassurance of God's affection for his people, for those who trust him for their salvation. Called to be saints, the word saints means holy ones or set apart. Paul is saying that the believers in Rome are called to be holy, set apart for God. This calling is an exclusive to just a few, but applies to every single believer. It reflects the idea that every believer is called to live a life that reflects God's holiness. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect, right? Or that we will one day be perfect in our flesh bodies, okay? That's not, not how it works. In fact, it's far from it. But what the Holy Spirit does is he does a work inside the believer and holiness itself stems purely from putting your trust in Christ his finished work on the cross and believing the gospel that makes you holy that justifies you in itself christ himself justifies you it's also important to point out that this calling is not limited to just a small group once again same as with the predestination earlier god calls all people to salvation and holiness and those who respond by faith are considered saints this again contrasts with the Calvinist idea of predestination where one certain person or only certain people are, are chosen for salvation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, he regularly opens up his letters with blessings of grace and peace. Grace refers to unmerited favour of God, the foundation of Paul's gospel message. Believers are saved by, by God's grace, not by works. Not by anything that they do. Not by being a part of so-and-so church or not. It's irrelevant. Peace refers to the reconciliation and harmony between believers and God that comes through Christ's sacrifice. This is the peace that results from salvation. Peace with God and peace with the community of believers. 
Both grace and peace come from God the Father and Jesus Christ, showing the unity of the Father and the Son in providing salvation. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Well, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Paul begins by expressing his gratitude to God for the believers in Rome. Notice how Paul gives thanks through Jesus Christ. This shows that Jesus is the mediator between God and us, humanity. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5. To all the Catholics and Orthodox out there, I don't mean to pick on you, but there is no praying to dead people. There is no praying for dead people. There is no going to God via Mary. There is no going to God via the saints. Right? There is only one way to God, and that is directly through Jesus Christ. This is what Paul taught. This is what the scripture says. I don't care what certain people in your church or the tradition have come up with. This is not the truth. The truth is in the scripture and it was revealed directly through the Apostle Paul. It's not up for argument. Everything Paul does, including offering thanks, is done through Christ, emphasizing his central role in our relationship with God. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Well, Paul praises the Roman believers for their strong faith, which has become known and celebrated throughout the Christian world at the time. This tells us that their faith was visible. They were living out their faith in a way that was obviously evident to others. They were rejoicing. They've been set free from sin. They've been saved. Their faith was not hidden. It was not private. It was so impactful that obviously people must have been talking about it far and wide. It was spreading. This is a great example of how a believer's faith can influence others and glorify God even in the larger world. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So for God is my witness. Paul's really emphasizing here the sincerity and truth of what he's about to say. By calling on God as his witness, he shows that his actions and intentions are before God, who knows his heart. They're, he's, he's being open before God. It's a way of underscoring that what follows is not just empty words or flattery but it's genuine what he's about to say whom I serve with my spirit Paul's service to God isn't just outward or physical it's spiritual and it's heartfelt he's committed to serving God with his whole being from his spirit the deepest part of who he is this reflects Paul's total dedication to the gospel of Jesus Christ it also shows that Paul's service isn't just about following religious rituals and external practice in fact it's got nothing to do with any of that his service to God flows from his inner being driven by love the love of Christ and a deep sense of purpose in preaching the gospel of God's son in the gospel of his son Paul serves God through the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news that Jesus died was buried and rose again for the salvation of mankind Right, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. This here is the gospel. Christ's death, burial and resurrection as payment for sin by which you are saved. If you believe that, if you stand on that truth, you are saved. That's not, some people believe that uh, to suggest that you're saved would be arrogant. How dare we suggest that we're saved? This is not Islam where... Uh, their their religion really is that that you you have no right to decide whether or not you are saved Allah determines that according to their religion regardless of how good or bad you are it's, it's up to what mood he's in on the day this is the opposite of what the Bible teaches God promises us salvation through Christ trust in his finished work it's as simple as that anyone can understand it anyone can accept it Paul's whole life is dedicated to proclaiming this gospel, which is distinct, as we've spoken about before, extremely distinct from the gospel of the kingdom that was preached to Israel. The gospel of the kingdom required works, repentance, water baptism. You had to keep the commandments. Jesus told them to keep the commandments. Peter said to keep the commandments. We are not keeping the commandments here because 
we have the revelation of the mystery. The gospel of the grace that Paul preaches is centered on the finished work of Christ and his service to God is deeply rooted in making this message known to both Jews and Gentiles. That without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Well, Paul emphasizes his constant prayers for the Roman believers. Does he sit there and pray to Mary? Does he, does he go and pray to dead people? No, he prays directly to Christ. His deep care and concern for them are evident in how frequently he prays for them, even though he hasn't yet visited Rome. This shows Paul's heart for the churches and his dedication to interceding for his fellow believers. His prayers are a reflection of his love for the body of Christ and his commitment to their spiritual growth. Verse 10, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Well, Paul continues the theme here from the previous verse where he mentions praying for the believers in Rome. He adds the part of his prayer includes a specific request to visit them. He has a deep desire to be with the Roman believers in person and he's been praying about it for some time. If by any means now, at length, I might have a prosperous journey. This phrase expresses Paul's longing to visit the Roman church showing that he has been wanting to make this journey for a while but has faced delays. It emphasizes his persistent desire and effort to make it happen. I might have a prosperous journey, he says. Paul prays that his journey to visit the Roman church will be successful. He's asking for God's guidance and blessing on his travel plans. He's not doing um, a Kenneth Copeland job here or a Jesse Duplantis where he's asking for a private jet and you know a 30 million dollar jet to to move around the word prosperous here doesn't necessarily mean material prosperity but a successful and smooth journey according to god's will by the will of god paul is careful to acknowledge that his desire to visit rome will only happen if it is god's will he doesn't just presume that his plans are automatically going to align with god's purpose but he submits his desires to the will of god this shows Paul's humility and recognition that even his plans for ministry must be subject to what's God's wills. This attitude reflects a deep understanding that God is sovereign and that Paul's travel and ministry are ultimately in God's hands. Verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you might be established. All right, so for I long to see you, well, he's got a deep desire to visit the believers in Rome. This long isn't just about some kind of social connection. It's rooted in his pastoral heart, his desire to speak the truth to these people, minister to them. Despite not having founded the actual church in Rome, Paul feels that a strong connection and responsibility towards those believers, which highlights his commitment to the body of Christ, no matter where they are. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Well, Paul wants to share a spiritual gift with them, something that will benefit their spiritual growth. It's not trying to get them to speak in tongues or roll around the floor like they do at these concerts in the modern day. This is ridiculous. Okay? Something that will benefit their spiritual growth. I love the way these people roll around and speak in tongues and that. They don't even know the gospel. They don't even know what saves them. How's that a spiritual gift? It's a lie. It's a deception. Okay. This gift that Paul's talking to is likely a teaching, an encouragement, some kind of spiritual wisdom, which his books and letters are full of, that would help them grow in their faith, help them be grounded in the truth. He's not speaking about material gifts, but about spiritual resources that would build them up in the Lord. This phrase reflects Paul's desire to equip the Roman believers with something that strengthens them spiritually, helping them to better understand their faith, better understand God's plan and live it out more fully. To the end, you might be established. Well, Paul's ultimate goal is to see the Roman church established, meaning he wants them to be strengthened and firmly grounded in their faith. He desires for them to be stable and mature in their walk with Christ, not easily shaken or, or led astray. The word established refers to being solidly built up in faith, having a strong foundation, spiritually mature. 
Paul's ministry wasn't just about like how many conversions, how many people can we get in through the door so that we can get tithing or all this kind of rubbish that the churches do today. It was about spiritual growth and stability. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That is, Paul's clarifying what he meant in the previous verse. He isn't only coming to Rome to impart something to them, but also he wants to actually receive something in return. What, tithes, money? No. He's making it clear that this isn't a one-sided relationship. He desires a mutual benefit from their time also that I may be comforted together with you. Paul recognizes that his visit to the Roman church is going to bring him encouragement and comfort as well. He understands that fellowship among believers is a two-way street. Even though he's an apostle, he still finds comfort and encouragement in the faith of other believers. This humility shows that Paul didn't view himself as above them, but just as a fellow believer in need of support, just like them. The term comforted here can also mean encouraged. Paul is looking to be strengthened and uplifted lifted by the Roman church, just as he hopes to do for them. By the mutual faith, both of you and me, well, this phrase emphasizes the idea of shared faith. Paul and the Roman believers share the same faith in Christ, and that common faith is a source of mutual strength. It highlights how the faith of believers edifies one another, no matter who you are, whether you're an apostle, a teacher, a new believer, mutual encouragement is a powerful part of the Christian fellowship. Paul recognizes that the faith of others can uplift, challenge, and inspire. Even as an apostle, he values the faith of the Roman believers, knowing that they can strengthen each other in their shared walk with Christ. Verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Well, Paul is making sure that the Roman believers understand that he has been wanting to visit them for a long time by saying, I would not have you ignorant. Paul's emphasizing that he doesn't want them to understand his absence or think he wasn't interested in them. He wants to clear up any potential confusion or any doubt. Oftentimes I purpose to come to you, but was let hitherto. Well, Paul explains that he had many times planned to visit them, but some, something always prevented him from doing so. The phrase, but was let hitherto, means he was hindered or prevented from doing something. This could have been due to circumstances, ministry work elsewhere, or maybe divine intervention, because Paul was given revelation. So he doesn't really go into detail about those reasons. But this does show Paul's determination to visit them, even though his plans had been interrupted or delayed. His desire to visit wasn't just a passing thought. He had a clear purpose of going, that I might have some fruit among you also. Or Paul's desire to visit the Roman church was to bear spiritual fruit. He wanted to be productive in his ministry among them, just as he had been in other places. The fruit that Paul refers to likely means converts, spiritual growth and encouragement within the church, helping them grow in faith and bringing more people to Christ. Paul's interested in building them up spiritually and seeing the results of his ministry in their lives, even as among the Gentiles. Paul makes it clear that the Roman believers who were largely Gentiles are, are not just some afterthought. He'd been fruitful among other Gentile churches and he desires to see that same spiritual impact in Rome. This reflects Paul's mission to the Gentiles, showing that he saw the Roman church as an important part of his overall ministry. Verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Well, I am a debtor. What does that mean? Paul begins by describing himself as a debtor, meaning he feels an obligation or a duty to preach the gospel. He owes them. He's a debtor. When you're a debtor, you owe it doesn't mean that he owes money, but rather that he has a responsibility. He owes them the good news. He wants to sh share the good news with others. His calling to proclaim the gospel comes from God, and Paul sees it as a moral and spiritual obligation to everyone, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Well, in this context, Greeks refers to those who are part of the civilized Hellenistic culture which included educated and cultured people who spoke Greek and 
were often seen as wise. Barbarians, non-Greeks, people who were outside the Greek-speaking world and were often viewed as uncivilized or unrefined by the Greeks, maybe the um, gladiators, that kind of thing. Maybe they weren't even around at that time, but people that were uncivilized. Paul is saying that he is responsible for preaching the gospel to all people regardless of their cultural or ethnic background. The gospel message is not just for one group, but for the whole world, both to the wise and to the unwise. Here, well, wise obviously refers to the educated or the intellectual bunch, while unwise refers to the simple or the uneducated people. And the gospel is very simple. You don't need to be educated to understand. In fact, the more educated that you are, the more difficult it is to understand because it is so simple. Paul makes it clear that the gospel is for everyone, whether they are highly educated or have very little knowledge at all. The gospel doesn't discriminate based on intellectual ability. Paul feels an obligation to share this message with people from all walks of life. Of life. Verse 15, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So as much as in me, is Paul's expressing his eagerness and determination to preach the gospel to the believers in Rome. The phrase, as much as in me is, means that Paul is giving everything he has, his full energy, his full commitment. He's ready to pour himself out and do everything in his power to fulfill his mission. It shows Paul's passion and willingness to serve the gospel, holding nothing back. I'm ready. Well, Paul states that he's ready. He's eager to preach the gospel. This readiness reflects his constant preparation and willingness to serve whether, wherever God calls him to go. His heart is always focused on spreading the gospel and he's been looking forward to this opportunity to come to Rome. To preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Also, although Paul is writing to a group of believers in Rome, he still expresses his eagerness to preach the gospel to them. This shows that the gospel isn't just for the unsaved, but is also for believers. It is a foundation of spiritual growth and maturity. Paul's goal isn't only to bring new converts to Christ, but to ensure that all believers, including those in Rome, are continually nourished by the gospel and growing in their faith. Rome was the centre of the Roman Empire and reaching the believers there was of great importance. By stating that he is ready to preach the gospel to them, Paul highlights the strategic importance of the Roman church in getting that gospel spread further. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's boldly declaring here that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in a world where many might have been embarrassed, and many still are embarrassed, hesitant to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially in a sophisticated city like Rome, Paul stands firm. He has full confidence in the truth and power of the gospel and he is proud to proclaim it despite any opposition, any persecution, any ridicule. It doesn't matter. This is a powerful reminder for believers to stand firm and not be ashamed of the gospel even when the environment might be challenging and even hostile for it is the power of God unto salvation. The reason Paul's not ashamed is that the gospel is God's power to save people. The word power here comes from the Greek word dynamis, from which we get dynamite. It shows the incredible, life-transforming power that the gospel holds. It is dynamite. It's not just a message. It's the power of God that brings about salvation to those who believe it. It's nothing else that brings you salvation other than Christ's finished work on the cross. This highlights that salvation itself comes from God's power, not human effort. It's God's work through the gospel that brings people to repentance and faith. To everyone that believes, the gospel's power to save is available to everyone. The key is whether or not you want to believe it. It does not matter who the person is or where they came from. The only condition for salvation is faith in Christ faith in Christ's finished work, trust in Christ's finished work. This emphasizes the universal offer of salvation through the gospel, accessible to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul acknowledges here the order in which the gospel was presented. Jesus' earthly ministry was primarily to the Jews, right? 
The early church began with Jews in Jerusalem. This is the gospel of the kingdom. However, the gospel didn't stop there. It was also meant for the Gentiles. It was to extend to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. This, right, this phrase here reflects the fact that the gospel was first preached to the Jews, which was God's chosen people through whom he revealed his promises. But it is equally available to Gentiles. Paul's ministry was focused on reaching the Gentiles, showing that God's plan for salvation extends to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. For therein, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right. So the word therein refers to the gospel mentioned in the previous verse. Paul is saying that the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. Christ's death, burial and resurrection is payment for our sin. This righteousness is not something that humans can produce on their own. It is a gift from God made possible through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of God refers to his perfect holy character and his standard of what is right. Through the gospel, God's righteousness is not only revealed, but it's also imputed to those who believe. It's put into you. It shows how sinners can be made right with God through faith, not by the works of the law. When it says from faith to faith, well, this phrase here highlights the central role of faith in receiving God's righteousness. It may mean that faith begins and ends with faith. That is, the entire process of salvation is based on faith from the moment of belief to the ongoing life of faith. Another interpretation of this is it refers to the idea that faith spreads from one person to another as the gospel is preached and more people come to faith. Whichever way, the point is that faith is the key to accessing God's righteousness. It's not based on human effort. It's not based on your works. It's not based on keeping the commandments. It's not based on obedience to God's law. It is entirely by faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. This is a quote from Habakkuk 2.4 in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament pointed to this, except it was revealed to Paul in full. This Old Testament verse declares that those who are justified or made righteous will live by faith. Paul uses this to show that faith has always been the means by which are made righteous before God, even in the Old Testament. The phrase shall live by faith emphasizes that both eternal life and the daily walk of the believer are rooted in faith. Justification. Justification means being made right with God. You, you, know, you want to be made right in front of God. That comes by faith. And we are justified by the faith of Christ. All right? The ongoing Christian life is also lived by continually trusting in God. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, Paul transitions here from discussing the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel in verse 17 to the wrath of God being revealed. God's wrath is holy and, and it's a just anger towards sin. It's revealed from heaven, showing that this is a divine response to human rebellion. God's wrath is not arbitrary or unjust, but it is the result of his righteousness and holiness in the face of human sinfulness. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, well, the wrath of God is directed towards all forms of ungodliness, lack of reverence towards God, unrighteousness, moral wrongdoing in humanity. These two terms cover both a person's relationship with God, ungodliness, and their relationship with others, unrighteousness. Ungodliness refers to people's refusal to honour and worship God properly by trusting in Him alone. And just living as though God is irrelevant or doesn't even exist, claiming to be an atheist and this kind of stupidity. Unrighteousness refers to the moral wrongs people commit against one another, violating God's standards of right living. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness? Well, this phrase describes people who suppress the truth by living in unrighteousness. They know the truth about God through creation, conscience, right, or revelation, but choose to reject it and live in a way that opposes God's standards. Okay, this is non-believers. It also refers to people who call themselves believers. These are the dangerous ones. These are the vain believers who teach others that they must do works like baptism. They must join a church. They can pray to saints. They can pray to Mary in order to get to Jesus. 
you know, you might see believers sitting there looking down on people out there going, oh, I'm not like those sinners. I'm not, well, look at the way that person's dressed or look at the, what they're doing. You know, as though they're more right, righteous and holy, extremely dangerous people. These people know about God, and may appear very holy and righteous in the eyes of men, but they trust themselves rather than Christ, so they therefore hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hold means to suppress it, restrain it. These individuals deliberately suppress the truth of God in their lives by choosing to live in sin. Non-believers, well, they're just living in sin. Believers that say that they believe, you probably find that they'll pretend that they don't sin. They'll act like they don't. They'll actually, some, some of them actually believe that they don't sin. Very dangerous. They know what's right. They choose to reject it, leading to God's righteous wrath being revealed. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, because Paul is explaining why people are without excuse for their ungodliness and unrighteousness. He says there are things about God that can be known, specifically aspects of his character and nature that are evident and understandable. The phrase manifest in them means that God's existence and some aspects of his nature are clearly revealed within humanity itself. When you just look outside, you can see the trees, you can see the oceans, you can see the mountains, the everything around us. Through their conscience, reasoning, their inner awareness, people can know certain truths about God. There's an internal understanding of God that's naturally present in every human being. For God showed it to them. Not only is there an internal sense of God, but God has also revealed it through external means, through his creation, through his actions in the world, so that people are without excuse when it comes to recognizing his existence and his power. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Well, so although God's attributes are invisible, they've been made clearly visible through his creation. Ever since the world was made, the evidence of God's existence and nature can be seen in the things he's created, the universe, the earth, and all living things. Creation itself reveals the reality of God's power and divine nature, being understood by the things that are made. Well, people can understand God's invisible qualities by observing and contemplating the natural world around them. The complexity, the beauty, beauty and order of creation testify to a creator who is powerful, eternal and divine. This understanding is available to everyone because everyone can see it. Everyone can experience creation even if they can't see. Even his eternal power and Godhead, specifically God's eternal power, and Godhead are revealed through creation. These attributes, the infinite power that created and sustains the universe and his divine authority are obvious to anyone who looks at creation. The vastness of the universe, the laws of nature and the intricate design of life all point to a creator who is all powerful and divine so that they are without excuse. Paul concludes that because God has made his existence and divine nature so clear through creation, people without excuse for rejecting him. No one can claim ignorance because God has made it evident to all. There's plenty of evidence in the visible world to see God's power, his deity, leading humanity accountable for responding to that revelation. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Paul's saying that although people had the knowledge of God through creation, as explained in the previous verses, they did not respond to him properly. They had an inherent awareness of God's existence, his power and his nature, yet they chose to ignore or reject that knowledge. They glorified him not as God. Even though they knew God, they refused to honor and worship as God. They didn't give him the glory or the reverence that he deserved. Instead of acknowledging God's rightful place as creator and sovereign, they turned away from him, leaving, living, living as though he was non-existent, totally irrelevant. 
neither were they thankful. In addition to, falling to, glor- to failing to glorify God, they were not thankful at all. They didn't recognize or appreciate God's provision and goodness, even though all of creation points to his care and generosity. So ingratitude is a sign of spiritual blindness, a sign of a hardened heart, and that leads people away from the truth of God. That became vain in their imaginations. So as a result of rejecting God, people became vain and their thoughts and reasoning empty, meaningless. Their thinking became futile and pointless because it was disconnected from the truth of God. When people reject the knowledge of God, their understanding becomes clouded and they begin to embrace worthless and irrational ideas about life, creation and existence. If you look around at what's going on in the world today, the whole world's filled with this stuff. And their foolish heart was darkened. This rejection of God's leads to a darkened heart. This rejection of God leads to a darkened heart. Their hearts, which should have been filled with the light of God's truth, became foolish and therefore spiritually darkened. Without God's truth, their inner being was filled with spiritual blindness and ignorance. This darkening of the heart is a consequence of turning away from God and choosing to live in spiritual rebellion. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 22, Paul's addressing the attitude of those who've rejected God's truth. These people claimed to be wise and believed they had understanding and insight about life and and the world around them. They thought they had superior knowledge, especially after turning away from God and relying on human reasoning or philosophy. This just reflects human pride, thinking that by rejecting God, they could find wisdom on their own terms. They became fools. Despite their claims of wisdom, Paul says that they actually became fools. Their rejection of God led them into foolishness, not wisdom. No matter how much human knowledge or intellectual ability they may have had, by turning away from God, they lost the foundation of true wisdom, which begins with the knowledge of God. The Bible often contrasts human wisdom with godly wisdom, And here Paul is showing that when people reject the source of true wisdom, which is God, they become spiritually foolish, no matter how wise they think that they are. The science community in the world is a perfect example of that. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This reinforces the idea that true wisdom begins with acknowledging and honouring God. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible, like corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God. Well, Paul's highlighting the profound error of idolatry. Humanity and its rejection of the truth of God exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God, the perfect, eternal and infinite creator for lesser earthly things the glory of god refers to his divine nature majesty purity which is far beyond human comprehension by re- by rejecting the true uncorruptible god people turned away from worshiping the eternal and unchangeable god to worshiping corruptible things into an image made like to corruptible man well the first step in this de- degradation is that they reduce god to the image of a corruptible man Instead of worshipping the one true God, people began creating idols that looked like humans. This is fundamental reversal of the created order. God made man in his image, Genesis 1.27, but in their foolishness, we have made God into our image. And in doing so, we dishonour him. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Idolatry didn't stop just with the human form. It went further as people made images of animals worshipping creatures like birds, land animals, and even insects. This is the corruption of worship as people directed their devotion toward the created world rather than the creator. This downward spiral into idolatry reflects the spiritual foolishness that comes from rejecting the knowledge of God. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, so because, God, because people chose to reject God and worship created things, God gave them up to their own sinful desires. 
this phrase means that God allowed them to follow the sinful path they'd chosen. He let them go their own way as a form of judgment. God doesn't force people to trust him. He doesn't force them to do anything. When they continually reject them, he allows them to experience the consequences of these choices. To uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Well, the uncleanness here refers to moral impurity, particularly related to sexual immorality. Paul says that God allowed them to indulge in the lusts of their own hearts, meaning their inner sinful desires led them into degrading behavior. The heart, in biblical terms, refers to the core of a person's being, including their thoughts, emotions, their will. These desires led to a life of uncleanness and impurity. So dishonor their own bodies between themselves, the result of being given over to the lusts was that they began to dishonor their bodies. They used their bodies in ways that disrespected the dignity and honor that God intended for them. This, ref this, refers, this phrase here refers to sexual sin and the misuse of the body in ways that go against God's design for purity, dignity, and honor. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Paul's highlighting the deliberate exchange that took place when people rejected God. They knew the truth about God, but they exchanged it for a lie. The truth of God refers to the reality of who God is, His power, His divine nature, His holiness. And the lie is idolatry, worshipping something or someone other than the true God. This exchange is at the heart of sin, choosing a falsehood over God's truth. And worshipped and served the, creator, uh, the creature more than the Creator. Instead of worshipping the Creator, the one true God, people begin to worship created things. This can include any form of idol, from a wood, wooden artifact, a piece of stone, to modern day forms of idolatry such as money, power, people, paintings on your wall, anything at all. Idolatry is the act of giving something created the worship and devote, devotion that only God deserves. It could be a car, it could be anything. This is a misplaced devotion and a rejection of God's rightful place as the Creator. Who is blessed forever, amen? Well, Paul adds a declaration of praise here, reminding the reader that despite humanity's rejection, God is still blessed forever. God is eternally glorious and worthy of worship, regardless of whether people choose to honor him or not. And the word amen is pretty straightforward. It's affirmation. It means so be it. Paul's affirming that God is eternally worthy of praise and blessing. Now, for this cause, in verse 26, God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did, exchange, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Well, so, for this cause, Paul's explaining the reason for God's judgment, because people rejected the truth of God, and they worshipped idols and engaged in idolatry. God gave them over to their sinful desires. This is the dis direct consequence of their turning away from God. God gave them up to vile affections, just as in earlier verses, God gave them up to their sinful passions. This phrase means that God allowed them to follow the sinful desires of their hearts as a form of judgment. The vile affections mean shameful, dishonorable desires, sinful cravings that lead to immoral behavior, especially in the area of sexual sin. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Paul points out that even the women, who traditionally might have been seen as morally reserved in the ancient world, exchanged natural sexual relations for those that are unnatural. The phrase natural use refers to God's intended design for sexual relations, heterosexual relations with the boundaries of marriage. The unnatural use refers to homosexual acts or sexual practices that go against God's created order and design. Paul's highlighting the distortion of God's plan for sexual relations when people turn away from his truth. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Paul continues from the previous verse here describing the similar sinful behavior of men. Just as the women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, the man also abandoned the natural order. Leaving the natural use of the woman, well, again, Paul refers to men's abandoning God's natural design for sexual relations, which are meant to be between a man and a woman within the context of marriage. 
by rejecting this natural use, men turned to other forms of sexual behaviour that were outside of God's intended design. Burned in their lust one toward another. Well, the, t the phrase burned in their lust highlights the intensity of their sinful desires. Instead of pursuing natural relations with women, the men were conformed and consumed with lust for one another, engaging in homosexual behaviour. This phrase indicates a passionate and uncontrollable desire that has taken over their actions, driving them into sinful and unnatural behaviour. Men with men working that which is unseemly. This refers specifically to homosexual acts between men. Paul describes these actions as unseemly, meaning shameful, improper. The behaviour goes against God's design for sexual relationships and represents a departure from the natural order that God established receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Paul adds that these men received in themselves the penalty or consequence for their sinful behaviour. This recompense refers to the natural consequences of living in sin. When people live contrary to God's design, they experience the effects of that rebellion, whether physical, emotional or spiritual. Paul suggests that these consequences are appropriate or meat. They were fitting for the error and rebellion that they had open, uh, embraced with open arms. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, well, Paul is saying that people intentionally rejected God's truth. They chose not to acknowledge God or retain Him in their thinking at all. Despite knowing the truth about God through creation and conscience, they deliberately chose to exclude him from their lives, living as if God had no place in their thoughts or decisions. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Because of their persistent rejection of God, he allowed them to fall further into their own sinful ways. A reprobate mind refers to a debased, corrupted, morally corrupt mind. This is a mind that's no longer able to distinguish between right and wrong because it's been hardened by sin. God's judgment here is to let them fully experience the consequences of the rejection by allowing their minds to become fully consumed by their sinful desires. To do those things which are not convenient, well, the result of a reprobate mind is that people engage in behaviours that are not convenient, meaning behaviours that are inappropriate, improper, sinful. The phrase refers to people acting in ways that go against both God's moral law and natural order. These behaviours reflect the moral decline that comes from rejecting God and being given over to sinful thinking. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Okay, being filled with all unrighteousness. Paul begins by stating that those who have been given over to a reprobate mind are completely filled with sin and unrighteous behaviour. Their lives are now dominated by actions that go against God's standards of righteousness and holiness. Fornication, sexual immorality. Fornication is sexual behavior outside the marriage covenant. It's one of the key manifestations of moral decline that comes from rejecting God. Wickedness. This is a broad term that refers to all kinds of evil actions and intentions. It indicates that the heart set on doing wrong with no regard for God's laws or, or the well-being of others. Covetousness, it's an insatiable desire for more, whether it's material possessions, power, something that belongs to someone else. It's the greed and discontent that drives people to pursue things selfishly and often unjustly. Maliciousness, this term refers to intentional harm. Maliciousness is a desire to hurt others, either through words or actions, and it reflects a heart that has become callous and hardened by sin full of envy, envies the resentment of others' success or possessions. It leads to bitterness and desires to see others brought down rather than rejoicing in their blessings or their achievements. Murder, well, this is an extreme manifestation of hatred and envy, the taking of another person's life. Murder is the ultimate act of violence driven by hatred, anger, jealousy. Debate, contentiousness or quarreling, fighting. It's a habit of constantly arguing or stirring up strife and division, often with selfish or prideful motives. Deceit, well, it's obviously lying and dishonesty. Those who are filled with deceit seek to manipulate others and hide the truth for their own benefit. 
Malignity refers to ill will or cruelty. It's a deep-rooted intention to harm or destroy others, often through evil actions or words. Whisperers. This refers to gossipers, people who spread rumours and secrets in order to harm others or stir up trouble. Whisperers work behind the scenes to tear others down through slander. When we go to verse 30, we've got some more. We've got backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Well, backbiters are those who seek to speak maliciously or slander others behind their backs. It's a form of gossip that tears people down when they're not present, showing a lack of integrity and love for others. Haters of God, these are individuals who've got a deep-seated hostility toward God. They reject God's authority, they're His truth and His existence and live in rebellion against Him. Their lives and actions demonstrate their hatred for the Creator. Despiteful refers to those who are insulting, abusive, disrespectful towards others. These people intentionally hurt others, both through words and actions, and take pleasure in doing so. Proud. Pride is an excessive sense of self-importance and arrogance. The proud person elevates themselves above others and ultimately above God. Pride leads to rebellion as people refuse to acknowledge their dependence on God or their need for His guidance. Boasters are those who continually brag or boast about themselves, their achievements, their possessions. They seek to glorify themselves rather than God, often exaggerating their own importance or abilities. Inventors of evil things, well, these are people who are creative in devising new ways of doing evil. Instead of being content with ordinary sin, they look for new forms of wickedness that they can engage in. This highlights the corrupt creativity that sin can produce. Disobedient to parents, it's a rejection of the authority that God's placed in the family. It's one of the earliest signs of rebellion as children disrespect their parents. They often grow into adults who reject all forms of authority, including God's. This speaks to the breakdown of moral and social order that happens when family relationships are con corrupted by sin. 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. This refers to people who are lacking wisdom or spiritual insight. Despite having the opportunity to know God's truth, they've become foolish in their thinking because they have rejected Him. They are morally and spiritually blind, unable to discern what's truly right and wrong. Covenant breakers, these are individuals who are untrustworthy and break agreements or promises. A covenant represents a solemn agreement and breaking it reflects a lack of integrity and faithfulness. This could refer to breaking promises in personal relationships, businesses, or even with God. Without natural affection, this phrase describes people who have lost the natural love and care for family and close relationships. It refers to a lack of normal human compassion, such as the love of a parent would naturally feel for their child. Sin hardens the heart to the point where even the most basic forms of affection and kindness are absent. Implacable. This refers to people who are stubborn and unforgiving. They're unwilling to be reconciled, holding on to bitterness and refusing to make peace. These individuals lack any desire for compromise or forgiveness and they often remain in conflict with others. Unmerciful people are those who lack compassion and kindness towards others. Instead of showing mercy when someone is in need or has wronged them, they respond with harshness and judgment. They're devoid of the tender-heartedness that reflects God's character. Verse 32 who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do they sane, but have pleasure in them that do. So Paul's emphasizing that people are aware of God's righteous judgment. Even though they may reject or suppress the truth, they still have a basic understanding of God's moral law and the consequences of sin. Deep down, they know that certain actions are wrong and that God's judgment is against such sinful behavior that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Paul's pointing out that those who commit those sins, the sins he's listed throughout this chapter, are worthy of death. This refers to spiritual death, which is the ultimate consequence of sin, as well as physical death, which entered the world through sin. Romans 6.23, Paul says, For the wages of sin is death. This is not just a temporary 
punishment, but an eternal separation from God for those who persist in rebellion and reject God's offer of salvation. Not only do the same, well, this phrase highlights the fact that despite knowing God's judgment, people still continue to engage in sinful behaviour. Their knowledge of the consequences doesn't deter them from acting on their sinful desires, but have pleasure in them that do them, well, even more troubling. Paul notes that these individuals not only participate in sin, but also approve of and take pleasure in others who do the same. This indicates a deep level of moral corruption where people not only sin themselves, but also encourage and celebrate the sinful actions of others. This leads to a culture where sin is normalised and celebrated rather than condemned. So that's Romans 1. From verse 1 to verse 32, Paul's laying the foundation of the gospel of Christ by addressing several key themes. Obviously, Christ's divinity. Early in the chapter, Paul affirms Christ's divine nature and his role as the Son of God declared with power by his resurrection from the dead. Paul highlights that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine, emphasizing his unique identity and authority. The universality of the gospel, Paul makes it clear that the gospel's for everyone, for both Jews and Gentiles, for the wise, the unwise, for all people regardless of their background, status or education. This demonstrates that the gospel is inclusive and salvation is available to all who believe. Human sinfulness and the need for salvation, well from verse 18 onward, Paul paints a vivid picture of humanity's sinfulness and rebellion against God. He shows how people have rejected God's truth, worshipped created things instead of the Creator and fallen into moral degradation. By listing the various sinful behaviours, Paul is making the point that all people are guilty of sin. This is crucial because it sets the stage for the necessity of salvation through Christ. The behaviours Paul describes reflect the consequences of living apart from God and they illustrate why we all need Christ to be rescued from the power of sin and God's righteous judgment. In essence, Paul is establishing the foundation that Christ is the divine saviour whose gospel is for everyone. All people are guilty of sin. All of those things listed, you're guilty of one of them, all of them, I don't know, I'm guilty of all of them. And in need of salvation, which only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. This sets the stage for the rest of Romans where Paul's going to continue to build on these truths and explain in detail how Christ's work on the cross provides the means for our justification and salvation.